Hello and welcome to Magic is Real, starring Shannon Torrance. I'm a psychic medium and I am the host of this podcast. I was kidding about um, being the star. It, the star today is actually Angie Fenimore, and I'm very grateful to have her here. I'm going to explain to you why I have her on Magic is Real by reading her bio, her little bio here. There's much more to her than this. Angie Fenimore a 27-year-old wife and mother, haunted by abuse in childhood and overwhelmed by despair, was in a desperate state of mind. On the 8th January 1991, Angie attempted to end her suffering by taking her own life. What ensued was a near-death experience that took her to the brink of hell, where an encounter with God and Jesus saved her and gave her a new understanding of the purpose of life. Now, Angie is also the founder of Calliope Writing Coach, and I'm going to have you explain what that is, but I really want to share it with our listeners. So welcome, Angie. Thank you so much for being here. And I do want to say, yeah. I may have said this to you when I approached you, but Calliope is the name of one of my spirit guides. So I felt very uh, drawn. That's right. I thought we talked about it. I thought we There's did. A yes. Whole story about how come my husband actually argued with me. He's a marketing genius and he's like no one's going to be able to say it number one no one's going to know what that is but I'm like no she's the ninth daughter of Zeus the muse of epic poetry it's that's so cool. that's the, that's what we do <laughs> only yeah. I'm not muse. kind of like the star thing we share the and I love your background you know we're all stars sharing the sky together and my stand is that we are all the muse and that every human being is a storyteller. It just gets shut down. And wow. uh, so we wake all that up. Yeah. So I'd love for you to tell us first, um, just kind of, let's start there because I do want to talk about your work as a writer and what you, what service you offer to people. Sure. Getting Near death experiencers tend to come back with gifts of, you know, various, kinds. Um, that was when I started seeing um, people who were not in our realm, you know, various entities, various angels, you name it, I see it. <laughs> and then um, it's also, and I already, I think we all, ha all have these gifts within us already. And then they get woken up. And I think every gift that a near-death experiencer has, I think everybody has these. They just get woken up. And I'm also majorly dyslexic. And the way dyslexia works is it's just, you know, it's not scrambled words as much as it is that you see globally rather than in a straight linear, you know, line. And like Einstein was dyslexic. And what he said is that he flew with the atoms. So for me, because I was already a writer, I'm a near-death experiencer that happened to be a writer who wrote a book about my near-death experience that just went crazy. But um, what I was able to do to, to see are all the elements in storytelling. And I still don't know why the industry hasn't figured this out. They know it when they see it. They know it when they've got a hit on their hands. But... Um, you know, nobody bets on a losing horse on purpose. If they had it nailed, then everything would be a blockbuster. Everything would be uh, a bestseller. And so what I was able to sort out was, were the common denominators, what every bestselling story has, whether it's written well or not, you know, I coach people in writing well. However, I was very interested in the anomalies out there. And so I've um, been doing this professionally for 10 years. We run the most effective pitch conference in the industry where you go and you pitch. We teach you how to pitch. You spend three days with us. And uh, we. it's been 10 years since we had anybody that got a no from a publisher or a um uh top and we work with the top literary agents and wow. our readers anybody who follows through and uses the curriculum by the way it's all online and i tested it on my grandchildren to make oh, wow. sure that anybody can absorb it i mean we i have writers who um i have a, a writer who's has i can't remember what it's called now they've changed the name multiple personality disorders what they used to call it dissociative identity disorder 
dissociative identity disorder, yeah. several alters, serious abuse, um, best-selling author, uh, my youngest best-selling, new, like best, best-selling author um, is, was 14 years old when she was published. That's crazy. Um, and what's the name of your book? That one, that when you were talking Beyond about the, the darkness. Beyond, Beyond the darkness. Beyond and we're going to have links to all of this below. Yeah. And also, um, and there will also be a discount code for you to sign up and all of that, yes. which I will have you mention as well. Sure. But I did, but I also, so you were a writer um, even before your near-death experience. Well, Thanamores are writers. I hadn't been published but where it runs in the family, it's everybody in on my father's in my father's line. They write everybody. Yeah. So wow. yeah, that's great. So from um, and as I said at the end, we're gonna have I have all the, I'm gonna have everything in the description. Um, if you want to sign up for um, these workshops or classes and courses on writing, um, but I would love to know too you come from a writing family about you and your background and what your spiritual beliefs may or may not have been. Sure. So my father was 40 when I was born. I'm from, I was from his second marriage and my mother was very young, 18. And um, then my sister came along almost two years later and it was just idyllic. We uh, lived in Tucson, Arizona. When I was a kid, I was born in Phoenix and I'm in Prescott. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it was just, I mean, monsoon season, we're out there in our bathing suits. It was, you know, flagging down the ice cream and it was really magical. And, um, and then we moved to Las Vegas and my, my father was transferred and, uh, that's when things started to go a little haywire. It was the 70s. You know, it was 1970, um, 71 when we moved there. And so this was going on socially as well, right? Not just in my family. But my mother um, took a class at UNLV and the uh, professor, the instructor was a... Uh, psychologist who was running a commune deep in the recesses of Bryce Canyon and she dealt with anxiety and he suggested she come for the summer and it was crazy town um so we were with my father but we'd go see my mother and it there were other children there they were starving um there's no power they're living in teepees um and he, this one little boy was my, he was my age, nine years old, and he wasn't allowed to even talk to anybody. They regularly took clothing, like you were allowed your underwear. They took shirts, they took shoes, and they shaved your head so that you couldn't escape the kids. Um, and there was a lot of abuse that happened there. And um, things were so much worse with my father that I was grateful actually that we were with my father. Um, but, you know, you don't realize until you're grown when um, things really hit you. You know, we know this about uh, trauma um, recovery. And so I was sexually abused and dragged to horrible, you know, things taken along for all kinds of things that a child should not witness or experience. And, you know, we had no supervision and we went to go pick up my mother and we were told she's staying. So um, it was just me and my sister and my dad who was just off the deep end. And um, then he remarried and it got worse. <laughs> I looked just like my mother and my um, stepmother just, uh, my father never got over her. And so my stepmother just really didn't like me. And so it, things got even worse. And um, I thought, I'm just, you know, I'm going to get married. I got married young. I was 19 years old and it was frying pan to the fire. Um, and you should know we're friends now. And you should also know that uh, I'm complete with my parents. I have a lovely relationship with my mother. Oh, good. And, yeah. And then my father, you know, we were close all the way until he passed 
20, almost 25 years ago. Um, but we were able to have a conversation on his deathbed and get everything cleaned up. And I just told him he was really resisting um, passing over because he was afraid of what was going to meet him given all the things he'd done in his life. And I just said, look at me, dad, I turned out, you know, I turned out, you can own that. How about that? Yeah. And, yeah. And then he just went incoherent. That was it. And so I was able to have that lovely time with him and he does come visit my sister and I, but, um, so, and then also my ex-husband and I, my first husband, who I was married to when I wrote the book, when I had the near-death experience, we are also friends. And um, so all of that is complete. So and glad to hear that. Oh, That's beautiful. Yeah. And, um, but at the time, you know, you've got to consider this was uh, the early, it was the late eighties, mid eighties, and things just weren't what they are now. We recognize abuse. We know what that is. Um, and it was abusive and controlling. And I didn't realize the damage and um, that was happening. And then I got involved in changing laws governing uh, repeat violent sexual offenders um, and did a lot of work with this. And this was back in 89, 90, 91. We didn't know anything about healing from this stuff. And I had all kinds of victims coming to me saying, help me. And I couldn't even help myself. And that was the trigger that just kind of sent me over the edge. And um, so then I developed this cyclical depression that would hit me every January and June. And I would engage in really risky behaviors. I would not behave like myself. Um, and then I would become a recluse and wouldn't be able to go out of the house. And I didn't understand what was wrong with me. I did go seek therapy and they couldn't tell me what was, what was going on. And I had this, um, we lived in Japan, in Okinawa, Japan. We'd moved there. My husband was stationed on Kadena and I went to go get milk one night and it's an Island. I don't know what I was thinking and I didn't come home for two days. And um, one of the things that I did the next day was I went to the movies and I watched Flatliners. It was playing in the theater, which is this story about these, you know, college kids who are experimenting with near-death experience ending their life. And that's when it was just like, well, I'm sentenced. There's no hope. And then I went home and when I walked in the door, Two days later, mind you, there were my boys and they were five and two years old at the time. And my husband kneeling, praying for my safe return. And when I saw them, I, that was when I decided I can't, I can't do this to them anymore. They are better. They are better off without me. And because I had no understanding and no control over it. And this was going on for a couple of years. And so um, after everybody, it wasn't that first night, it was the next night after everybody went to sleep. Um, I took everything in the medicine cabinet and, uh, got in the bathtub with a razor blade and went to town. I was serious about this and, um, went and climbed back out and wrapped myself up and laid on the couch and it was about four in the morning and my husband was leaving for work and he asked me if I was okay. And I said, um, I was, and he knew better, but he had to go. Um, he worked, uh, he was an air weapons controller with NARAD. It's locked down, you know? And so he had to go. And then when my boys woke up, I sent them to my neighbor, who's a good friend of mine, um, with a note and just said, uh, mommy's not well. Um, and she took care of him. And then it was about 11 o'clock. Um, I, and I could feel it happening about that time. And it was this, um, the first thing I noticed was this incredible sound. It was very loud and the, it, and this vibration that accompanied it. And I thought that an an air fifth an um 
an F-15 was coming down in the neighborhood in my yard. And I turned to look out the window and it was, everything was fine. And that's when I realized that this experience was within me. I was having this experience within myself. And it was this noise, like I sound like I can't even describe and this vibration that I can't even describe. So powerful. And then it clicked, it's happening. Well, my stepmother had been in a car accident and she had had a near-death experience. It's the only near-death experience I'd ever heard of. That We're talking, this is 1991. It wasn't, you know, in the conversation yet, even though they were already studying it. Um, it just wasn't something anybody talked about. And she had gone to the corner of the room and watched doctors uh, working on her. And so I wanted to do that. <laughs> and so I opened my eyes and in thinking I'm going to see myself down, laying down on the couch. I open my eyes and I feel myself back in my body, just like that. And, uh, and I'm surrounded by this kind of yellow membrane. My arms are like this and I'm being squeezed and I see these red lines and I want to watch. So I open my eyes and as soon as I do, back in my body. So I start to realize that, um, that passing over required in part my will. And so then I just, you know, let myself like be swallowed up in this experience. And then I am completely surrounded by this yellow membrane and I'm like this, and I'm being squeezed through this tunnel. And then the next thing I see is I'm being held like this, like I'm a baby. And I'm looking up at who I think is me. I look exactly like my mother. So I'm experiencing both this woman who's holding me, her experience, plus my own. And so I'm confused as to who's who. I'm, I'm, you know, pretty certain that's me up here looking at one of my babies. I just wasn't sure because I'm experiencing it from both at the same time. But the, uh, the thing that was so powerful was this experience of euphoria and love and like I'd never experienced. And this came as a shock to me because I had believed for many years that my mother didn't want me that she didn't love me. And in that moment, I got her deep and profound love for me. And my own desire to be here, I wanted to be here. I wanted to live knowing that I was going to face some trials. And then I hear voices in the room and um, I can't make out what they're saying, but I know my father's there. And um, then I am taken to memories of my life all the way, bam, 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 my entire life. But I'm experiencing it. I can't change anything, but I'm experiencing it like it's happening. But I'm also experiencing it from everybody else's point of view as well. And in particular, they're, they're emotional, like what my actions cause. And, you know, not a, not all of it is bad or good. It's just, it was just the whole thing. And at some point I realized that I'm seeing this actually unfolding on a screen in front of me. And just as I get right to the end where I am laying on the couch and then it stops abruptly and I'm surrounded by darkness, but it's not like pitch black that you can't see. It's like the kind of darkness in space where there's just absence of light. And um, I realize that there's a presence next to me um, and I cannot see him, but I know that I know him. And he says, this is your life. Only well, he doesn't say it in words. It's just communicated. This is your life. This is the life you lived. And the most distinct thing about this was that there was no, uh, there's no kind of drama about it or significance even. It was just, this is it. 
this was your life, you know, facts. And um, that's when I realized I'm on the other side. And so I am suddenly very excited and I start looking around for my grandmother who had passed when I was a child. And my, um, I had a, a cousin who passed when I was uh, about 11. And then um, I had an uncle who was in a car accident. Um, and so I'm looking for them. And as I turn my head, there's nothing. And as I turn my head to the right, I notice that I'm there with a handful of teenagers. There are about six or seven of them. And the kid standing next to me, this boy is tall and he's got this dark uh, hair that's kind of spiky. And he's wearing a white t-shirt and a black vest and combat boots, jump boots that are black. And I think to myself, that's kind of interesting. I wouldn't think, and black eyeliner. I wouldn't have thought that these things would come through the veil, you know, with us. And um, so then I lean over and look at these kids and there's a girl down at the end and she's just this slight thing, um, very young, about 16 years old. And she's got this blonde stringy hair. And I think um, what could have been so bad in her life that she would end her life. And so then I have this thought, oh, we've all done the same thing. And when I have that thought, I notice the kid next to me turns, looks at me and looks back up. There's just nothing emptiness in his gaze. However, I know he heard me and I didn't move my mouth. So that's when I knew thoughts were audible. And so from this point, there are several things that happen at the same time. So as soon as I have this thought and realize I'm no longer in my body, um, it triggers the next part of the experience and I am taken from them and I travel upright at tremendous speed and they are left standing there together and I travel through this darkness. I have no idea how far um, and I don't know how fast, but it was like speed of light and, but there was no inertia. There's no G force. There's nothing like that. I'm just traveling through this space. And um, and this all happens very quickly where I see where I'm landing, but it's like a beltway and there are, it's filled with people and it's, I don't know, I don't know, 30, 50 feet deep, uh, this direction. And it goes for as far as I can see this direction. And I hear the word thousands and I don't know what that means. And I don't think necessarily the word thousands means exactly, you know, 2,300 plus a few or, you know, a hundred thousand. I think I really feel like the term, how that was communicated is like endless is, is what it actually meant. And then I ask, what is this? And I hear the word purgatory, which I think is very interesting because I don't have a Catholic upbringing. We kind of church hopped when I was a kid. And then I joined the LDS church for while I was, when I was a teenager. Um, and there's, I don't think that there is a word in um, Mormonism purgatory, but so none of my, none of my background is really, you know, uh, so I have no idea why I heard the word, but, um, but that is what it was. It was like a way station. And so I land into this space. And the first thing I notice is that all these people that are there are just kind of mumbling to themselves, kind of wandering. Um, they're all in these filthy white robes, but they're completely disconnected from each other. And we're packed in there like sardines and nobody cares about anybody else and they're saying things like if only you had dot 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 then I wouldn't have had to dot 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 those are the kinds of things mm -hmm. and I you know I can't make out in particular what anybody is saying 
necessarily, except for this one woman who was just super wailing. Um, but all of the conversations that are happening are happening to nobody. And they're all just completely disconnected from everybody around them, um, except for one man. And he was squatting um, and he was looking at me, observing me. And I had the thought about him. I wonder if this is Judas Iscariot because I knew he'd been there a very, very long time. And I knew that he'd taken his life. And um, those, those thoughts were mine. It wasn't like anything that I was told. It was just my thoughts about him. And um, in the moment that I had that thought, that's what triggered the next piece because an, an acknowledgement that there was a Judas Iscariot is acknowledgement that there was a Christ. So it is a form of testimony is what that was. And in that moment, I see this pinprick of light in the distance and it travels to me at tremendous speed. And as this light approaches, it's the, I can see that it's in the form of a man and that he's made of light. His hair is flowing, his robes are flowing and this, um, the molecular energy, the spiritual energy in the space where I was, it was kind of like this mist-like darkness that kind of hovered at about waist deep. It was like this crackling energy that had a life um, of its own and purpose of its own. And all the molecules start vibrating. This is God. This is God. This is God. This is God. And so he stops just outside the barrier. And I know he can't come in where I am. And it, it's an invisible barrier. We're, we're contained here. Um, but I do believe it's, it's self-imposed. Um, but he stops right outside the barrier. And he says, is this what you really want? And it hadn't even dawned on me that I had any choice. I felt like this was it. This is, I'm just doomed and that I'm doing everyone in my life a favor. And um, I say, but my life is so hard. And he says, it's supposed to be hard. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. Right. <laughs> it was very much like a conversation that you would have with a loving, caring parent who is really just like, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, they'd, yeah. they'd be upset. That's how they'd be. And so then he says, we can't skip over parts. We've all done this. Uh, you've been a terrible, you've been a huge tool for evil. Um, you, uh, it's like, it's not exactly words like you don't deserve your children, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the translation that I was not doing them justice. You know, I wasn't the mother that I, that I should have been and not like I was abusive or horrible or yeah. anything, you know, they knew they were loved. I mean, I loved those kids. However, every six months, the mom, you know, when your mom runs off to the grocery store and doesn't come back for two days, that's, you know. I'm, I'm introducing them to trauma is what I'm doing. And so, but I'm still, so I'm dumbfounded that I'm, it, it's, you know, dawning me, dawning on me that I did rank enough to have this conversation with God. And I also believed I was worthless, you know? Um, I mean, you really do have to have this self-belief that you don't matter to do that. And um, so it's occurring to me and I'm kind of dumbfounded, like I can't believe this is happening and just stunned, kind of stunned, silent. But then at the same time, I'm still like, yeah, okay, but I see no other way. I still couldn't see how I could do anything else. I, I couldn't, I had done everything that I knew to do to break this cycle. And, um, so then I see right next to this being of light that I know to be my father in heaven. I see 
pinpricks of light coming through this darkness. There is some kind of a, a, a membrane that's invisible. And he's been there this the whole time, but like I couldn't see him until I'm, and I'm not even uttering the words. It's just, but I can't do it. I can't do my life, you know? Great. Thank you very much. But I still can't do it. And I see these little pinpricks of light coming through um, this darkness. And then I hear his voice and it's the same voice that was with me at the beginning of the near death, death experience who said, this is your life. This is the life you lived. And he says, don't you understand? I did this for you. And when he says that, the, these words, I am taken into uh, three points of view. I am still standing in my spirit body in this dark plane, looking out, seeing these, these two beings of light. And then I'm also taken behind them so that I can see, perceive. I see myself off in the darkness and they're in front of me. <laughs> and I, I watch who I know to be Christ download my life into God the Father. Just all this light, this transference of information. Mm -hmm. And it is my life as I lived it, not just the facts. It's all how everything impacted me, how I got to where I was, all of it, how everything affected me emotionally, all the broken heartedness and um, just the broke, the brokenness that I was and how I got there. But it was every single moment of my life downloaded. And at the same time, I am taken into Christ's body 2000 years earlier while he is in the garden of Gethsemane experiencing my life from beginning to end. And he did that for all of us. And uh, so in that moment, that's when I realized somebody does get it. Somebody does understand. And, um, but I was still, but I can't, I don't know how to do this. I can't, uh, I can't take care of my children. I can't, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't do my life. And so then I'm shown what would happen to my boys without me. And I saw my oldest boy first and I got like an emotional roller coaster of their lives. And my oldest boy was taken to about 20 years old and he was rendered completely incapable of doing anything he was meant to do here um, he was just like in that exact state that the kid standing next to me at the beginning of my near-death experience was in, just like that, that kind of an energy. And then um, my second boy got to be about seven or eight, and then he was taken because he couldn't do this life at all without his mother. And so when I saw their lives and what would happen to them, I uttered this like, really just this teeny tiny not even a voice just okay and as soon as I did I was just up and above this plane and um I'm watching all these people dropping down onto the far right and it goes forever as far as I can see to the left and I'm told most people who are who are passing now are going to some kind of a, a way station like this, some kind of a place of darkness to work out what they need to work out. And then I'm surrounded by these beings of light that are just, just past me like this. And I ask, what is this? And I'm told, well, they're helping you. And they have been the whole time and they're preparing the earth that the earth can, can no longer tolerate um, everything that happens here. It's like the earth, it, it's, it's almost like it's beyond a grieving. It's like we harm the earth with the, the harm that we cause each other. And, uh, 
So they are preparing because there's this change coming of some kind. And then I'm traveling back through this darkness and I can still hear God's voice as I'm traveling through this darkness. And it's very quick on the way back. And I'm just downloaded these things that I need to know, things I need to understand, this healing um, until I'm in my body. And then I slip back in my body and I sit up and swing my legs down and I'm sitting there on the couch and I can immediately feel the effects of all the drugs that I took. I can hardly move. And um, I can still see, I can still hear God's voice. And um, and I'm told um, we get to, we don't get past the year 2015 without a major shift happening on our planet that, that our planet won't tolerate it anymore. And I saw it happen actually in 2013 is when that shift took place. So as I'm traveling back to my body, I'm downloaded all of this information, things that I need to know, things uh, like healing, I'm just imbued with healing. Um, but I'm also told some things about what's happening with our planet. Um, and it was just like information accessible, you know, pack the suitcase and on your way. Um, and I was told that we get to about the year 2015, uh, or we can't get past the year 2015, that there isn't a major shift that happens on the planet because the planet will no longer tolerate all the terrible things that happen here. Um, so it's, um, and I saw this point come in 2013 is when it just cracked and shifted tipping point. But um there it's it's like it's like the planet has the flu and um and is working through the effects the <laughs> symptoms <laughs> so sorry i usually turn everything don't off. worry i'll just i'm just gonna put oh, my hand up like so that's why okay there now I'm going to close my browser. Ta-da. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Oh, yeah. So 2000, I'll let you. 2015. Yeah, we don't get past 2015. Um, but it was more like, um, it wasn't like I got a number, 2015. It was more like I could just see the way that I could see my boys lives yeah see this coming to a crescendo coming to a head and so i saw this shift happen um this tipping point in 2013 and um that it, it, there were huge changes all of a sudden conversations of spirituality began to be commonplace and okay podcasts like yours right yeah enlightenment um and it's not like there is no darkness but there's light being shed upon this darkness now so it's like the earth has the flu and all the symptoms of having the flu but when you have the flu you need to sweat that helps heal you or you need to you know throw up your breakfast because you're going to feel better. So that's why we see earthquakes and tsunamis and these natural disasters. That's not an accident. It's the earth having the flu, basically. Um, and so there was much that I was not permitted to keep when I came back. Um, it just wasn't needed. And, and there was a lot that I was allowed to keep with me um, when I returned to my body. So when I slip back into my body, I, um, and something that I think is very interesting is very hard in my situation when you're trying to end your life, the body, the spirit does not want to come out of the body, but in the return, it was just very natural. And um, so I slipped back in my body and I sat up, swung my feet down and I could 
you know, I, I had the experience of all the drugs that I had taken. So I was just, I could hardly move, hardly function. My pupils are blown. Um, the, and this lasted for about three days, but, um, I'm sitting there on the couch and I look around the room and I look down at the couch and I can see the molecules. I can see the spiritual fiber of everything. I can see the molecules vibrating. We are, we are couch serving you, serving God, the pillow. We are pillow serving you, serving God, the table. We are table serving you, serving God. And then um, the plants were made of light, made of light. My TV, I could see the information that had passed through it, that will pass through it. Like I could see the spiritual, energetic light and darkness of the makeup of everything. You know, we 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 experience ourselves like a body and a spirit, and um, but there is this third creation of light and dark. And for you know, that's shifting constantly for human beings. Um, like smile and there's light you know you're in pain and there's more it's a constant shift and um cause harm to another human being darkness that's made of darkness but it's not like the expectation is that we are to be light all the time this is an experiment and in order to choose light we must experience darkness there is no way around this that is what we're doing here in order to choose love, you we must experience hunger, which is actually the opposite of love. Hunger is what drives all of it. Um, so then I'm sitting there and the door swings open, the front door swings open. And the room is just, the hallway is just bathed in this light, but I can see it differently. I can see all all of the elements of it. And my husband's walking through the door. I can see his silhouette, which is very strange because he's in lockdown at NORAD. They don't come home for lunch. And he comes through the door and he sits down on the love seat across from me. And I just say, you are never going to believe this. And he goes, I think I will. And uh, so then he said, well, do we need to take you to, you know, the hospital? And I hear God say, no, do not go to the hospital. If you do, they're going to ship you off to Hickam in Hawaii, the mental hospital. And um, he says, they, what more do you want? I restored you to life. <laughs> you know, there's nothing that they can do for you because you're healed in particular ways. Now, it doesn't mean that I didn't have to still sort out the trauma that I'd experienced as a child and as an adult. It didn't mean that I didn't still, still have to sort out my relationship with my husband. You know, it's like, I was even shown that how it's a yin and yang and how I had it that I'm the victim and he's the perpetrator. And what I saw was it's a dance. Mm, wow. <laughs> it's, I am a participant. And the minute I stop, step into, it stops that I was, I was contributing far more than I knew. All I had to really do in my situation, and I'm not saying this is for everybody, my situation was say, no, stop, don't do that again. Because if you do, here's what's going to happen. And, um, and I had like, carried on like this for 10 years. And um, so then I uh, continued that that was a gift that stayed with me is the ability to see spiritual light and darkness. So I don't, oh, I, like, I still see it every now and then lit up like trees, like on fire, light, brilliant. I still see it that way sometimes, but mostly I just um, experience the presence of it. Like we all have this ability. We can all do this. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. I, I, cause that's what I'm, I mean, all of that was really vivid. And also it's amazing how you can remember every detail all these years later. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about near death experiences. It's not like trying to remember a dream. It's like, from what I understand, realer than real so yeah. much so that you can 
recall all of these details that if an, if it was a life experience, by now you'd be like, I don't know, then something happened and I kind of can't remember, but it's like you can remember every single detail, right? Yes. So, you know, my sister has, she has the gift of dreams and she has what is very, very near death experience like in dreams. Yeah. Um, and I have had those as well, but it it's not the same quality. I'm not discounting it. I do believe those are messages. Yeah. For certain. And that we will have loved ones come visit us in our dreams and that that is real. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I've dropped, I've dropped acid. I've done LSD. I've done mushrooms. I've done all the drugs. I, I lived a really dangerous life there for a while. This is not that. Yeah. And while people can have life-changing spiritual experiences, you know, with peyote on a, you know, absolutely. But it's just not the same thing. A near-death experience, you are fully hyper-conscious in a way that, you, like, it's far more real than anything. This occurs like a dream. Yeah. A near-death experience. It's a heightened reality. Right. So you were talking, too, about being able to see all these lights and figures. And I, I assume, I think that's what you said. But as a medium, I'm very interested now in how you, what you just said about everyone has this ability because it's true. We're all mediums. Somebody said to me the other day, I wish I could do what you do. I said, you can, mm -hmm. you can. Uh, we're all mediums if you believe it. And you, yep. and you know, so I would love to hear more from you about That's that. the key. You just yeah. said it. If you believe it, believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. And I, I, I'm a Reiki master and there's a whole, you know, but there are all these modalities, right? Different access points to the same thing. Do your hands get hot? You know, can you see through your hands? There are modalities that go back all the way, thousands of years. They just have different languages. It's the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. But if we believe like this set of symbols that gives you access. It's your belief that gives you access. That's so, so if, you just read my mind. I was yeah. going to ask you about the symbols. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't matter. It could be, oh, fry an egg and put it on top of your head. If you believe that, that works fully. If you believe it, it works. <laughs> it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. I love that you said that because I'm a Reiki master too. And even I'm like, do we really have to do these things? Like, do we really need to, who made these things up and what are these symbols? And right. I, I always ask that question and I'm a Reiki master, but I love the fact that you just explained it that way. It's just sort of like, I think what you're saying is often like when I'm giving a mediumship reading, I start by saying what Teresa Caputo also says, which is, I'm just going to do this spiel. We may not need to do this whole presentation, but I'm doing this to let mm -hmm. spirit know I'm ready to work. It's really just setting an intention. I listen to a certain little YouTube video before I do a reading that's open your third eye. It's when I hear the little bing, I'm like, spirit knows I'm ready to work. I, just like the symbols. It's almost just like turning on a light switch. Yes, precisely. And there is power in the more people who believe Mm. the more power it has you can step into this funnel you know this kind of vortex of this power so when i am practicing um like i can see into people's bodies i can see like what they ate for lunch sometimes i can see what their ailments are in their physical bodies but i always like for me i'm i'm just really really uh, you know i don't follow any rules yeah. <laughs> at all yeah me um, neither. right but i always invite uh mother Teresa. i invite gandhi i invite christ to participate with me i'll invite martin luther king <laughs> i want their energy yeah. with me i always invite these entities and i believe they are there therefore they are you know that's so beautiful when you how do you now receive now that you're not seeing these entities and figures and lights all the time do you find that when you notice them, are they there because they really have something to say? Or is it just something like for a minute, you're kind of looking through the veil for whatever reason, maybe your soul kind of 
shifting in some way or is it always they're making themselves known to let you know something this is interesting um so i feel like it's very difficult to narrow down various purposes for entities revealing themselves um something that happens to me when i go stay someplace like gettysburg or you know uh louisiana yeah, places that have a lot of history that are really Philadelphia thick with spiritual mass, right? Um, I always see spirits. It happens right. every time. And what happened, uh, what I believe is happening there is these are people who are stuck in a realm. And just like I was having this conversation with God, I think that's what's going on. They want to be gotten. Like this woman who was saying, if only you had, I wouldn't have had to. They want to be gotten. I had this one experience in um, Louisiana. It was, uh, oh, where do they have Mardi Gras? I can't think of that. In name. Uh, New Orleans? Yes. I was yeah. at the Feet guest house. It was a known pirate. Interesting energy in um, uh in that area. And I think it partly got really muddled with Katrina. Um, it really just, it wasn't just the ground. It was all of it, you know, got just really mixed up. And, but it was very interesting because the people running this uh, bed and breakfast had no idea what the history of the house was, no idea. And I was sick. I'd come down sick. And a friend of mine was running off to go to the drugstore to get medicine. And so I decided I was going to lay on the bed. But I'm sitting there on the bed. And this woman comes through the room. And she's just tall and thin. And her hair is just really fine and um, almost like this pale brown. And it's pulled back in one of those buns like this with the big and then the bun this tight fit, you know, Peter Pan collar type thing, sleeves, and then skirt to the ground. She comes through the room and she sits in a chair and she's just empty and just this deep, 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 deep sadness. And so I lay down on the bed. She's gone. I lay down on the bed and I'm half awake, half asleep, which is this interesting space where things will open up in that space, you know, and uh, I'm laying, it, the sheets are white, perfectly clean white. I'm laying there. The room is butternut squash, painted butternut squash. There is a mirror on the wall over the fireplace. There is a chandelier in the ceiling, and there's carpeting in the room. And I'm laying there, and suddenly there is this girl. She looks to be about eight years old. She looks like that actress who plays Amelie. Very French, very, very pale skin, really dark, dark brown eyes, dark curly hair. And she is just intently looking at me. She's hovering above the ground off the side of the bed. She's intently looking at me, but it's like she's playing her life through me like I'm a projector, mm. a film projector. And I suddenly the room is blue uh there's no chandelier in the ceiling it's gone and there is a family portrait above the uh, fireplace and it's a husband a wife and two girls and it's wood floors and it is a sick room and then i am coughing and as i'm coughing there's blood spurting out of my mouth and so then I come fully, like I'm in between, I'm not asleep and I'm not awake. And I fully come to, there is no blood, but I quickly pull up my phone and I know yellow fever and I just search yellow fever. And the first thing that pops up is an image of, it's a drawing, an old drawing from like 1870. And it's like blood, that is how you died from yellow fever. That was what happened to this girl. And the more research I did, the more rumors there were that she'd been pushed down the stairs by her father. That isn't what happened. And so she was incomplete about this. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I always wonder, are they ghosts versus spirits? Like, I, I don't know. I've never had experiences with like stuck spirits, for example. And some people say that ghosts are just sort of energetic imprints 
and that spirits are actual, like the souls that we communicate with, right? So what do you think? So I believe that there's both. And like, you know, some of these experiences where people like the Queen Mary, for example, I grew up in Southern California yeah. after yeah. years old. There are certain spirits people see all the time and they see them doing the same things. I think that's like a footprint. Yeah. Time isn't real. And everything that we do is, uh, every moment is a creation. It's got a spiritual creation, a creation of light or darkness, and a physical creation once it happens in a timeline. And in that moment, it can be ex accessed. If you're not stuck in time, it can be accessed at any time, anywhere, as if it's happening now. So that's what I think it goes on. That makes sense. It feels like other dimensions. Yes. That's, that really makes a lot of sense. But I do believe these people I see or that I have seen, they know I can see them. Yeah. They can see me. Like maybe they can't see everybody else that's there. Do they it's know like, they're dead? Oh, that's, yeah. I was at um, the Farnsworth, which is, it's a, it's a bed and breakfast now, but it's the, the home in Gettysburg where the Civil War came to a head. And there was so much darkness in this house. And first thing I did is ask the guides, is, is there sexual assault in this house? Because it was so powerful and prevalent. And they immediately knew that I was somebody they wanted to like talk to. Yeah. And then I kept coming back to them and asking about this room and like what happened in here? It's horrible. And so they opened up the catacombs. They said that they locked those because people were actually getting shoved, getting hurt going down there. So they didn't take people down there for the tour anymore, but they took me down there. And you know how you can see through your hands, right? Uh, you can just feel that. And they, uh, there's like, it's kind of this, these walls and pathway. And they said, what do you feel here? And, you know, I did the thing. And I'm like, nope, it's behind me. And I said, there is a death and it's a child. And they're like, it's rumored that the owner of the home raped his daughter. She had a baby and he killed it and buried it down there. And wow. that room I could not even go into. It was so much darkness. But then we went up to the attic. And everybody's gathered in the attic. It's the end of the tour. They have benches there. And they're telling the story. And then the guides leave. And everybody's left to their own devices. And there are some amateur ghost hunters. And they set up a chair with the little you know, flashlight. And they've got the voice recorder, all the stuff. And a woman is saying... What's your name? Just having this conversation with whatever and whoever is there. Yeah. Um, and how old are you? Um, do you have any children? Are you married? And do you know you're dead? And as soon as she says, do you know you're dead? Um, everybody tells me, I don't remember this happening. I was just in that space in between. Um, and the door slammed shut. And there was this through the room that I felt this anger and all of a sudden my mouth is moving and the words are coming out and I say his name is Thomas he's married he's got a baby girl and yes he knows he's dead and he wants you to get uh what he died for what he gave his life for and so I go talk to these guides again <laughs> and they say well yes that was Thomas he would he was a sharpshooter. There were three sharpshooters up there um, in the attic, and he accidentally shot the only civilian that was killed in the Battle of Gettysburg across the street, and they hung him for it. Uh -huh. So my experience is they want, they wherever they are, if they know they are, wherever it is, they're incomplete. They, so that's what I finally got out of these experiences is like, I get them. I'm like, I get what you did and I experience it for them and I acknowledge them just you know kind of like a way you know a way for them to embrace light because Christ actually did experience yeah <laughs> and paid for everything right so that's what they're missing is that connection to that source that complete source of love and light so I can be a stepping stone you know, to that. Right. And do they ever move to the other realm or are they stuck or where, like, is part of them on the other side? Why are they still there? Yeah. I, I never really know. understand. 
Yeah, I I don't know because this almost always happens when I am staying someplace. Yeah. It's, <laughs> when I'm I, in don't, a <laughs> I don't know where they come from or what's going on there, but I do believe in it. I just know that I can't quite understand that that's the one sort of thing I haven't been able to find an answer to, really. But what I can tell you from my experience, having been on the other side in one of these places, yes, it's not permanent. That okay. You'll hear, you'll hear people say forever, which was my experience of it forever. That's forever. It, it's not a, yeah. there's no time. Sure. So it's as long as it takes for you to process and get the impact of your actions. Yeah. How does this impact others so that you're filled with empathy? Gotcha. That's all. You. And because empathy is our access to love. That's right. it. That's all yeah. it is. And you get to work that out. Now, the longer you're in an, a place that's filled with darkness where that energy is sucking the life out of you, the harder it is. However, at any moment, it just takes a thought and bam, you are in the presence of light. I think all of them, I do believe all these people wonder and having conversations were either talking to people like me or mm-hmm. their loved ones who couldn't hear them or they were having conversations with God. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, after, I think you you said so much in there, but I would love to know what you think based on your experience. Why are we put here in these bodies on this earth? What are we doing here? Yeah, that's a question I have too. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, you don't come back all knowing. It's an indication, you know, somebody's pulling your leg if they know it all. It's because all you get, we're gone. Your death experiencers are not gone very long, Mm -hmm. actually, if you think about it. And they, we come back with so much gone for minutes, maybe. Uh But I do not know. Um, I do know that there's a whole lot of conversation about choosing good over evil, to love, to this, to that. I do think that there's more to it than just to learn to love. I do believe the whole thing is about love. Mm -hmm. That's what it's made of. But it leaves me questioning, well, what comes after? What comes after ne- that near death experience, that entryway? Yeah, that's what I, we all up to, do you know? Yeah, because and- people say it's like helping, like these experiences are helping us grow somehow that happen here. And then we're supposed to learn something from them. Yeah, okay, are we but- nebulous angels running around? Yeah. With them, so. yeah. Then what do we do next? Like we go to the other side and like, I'm enlightened because I had this experience yeah. in Earth. I- I'm very curious about that myself. Yeah. But yeah. I tell you, I have complete peace about it. Mm-hmm. Like complete peace. I'm not like, I, I've i seen my death. I get to be in my 80s. And right. um, oh, so, very cool. yeah, but it's it's like, I'm ready any old day and mm-hmm. I'm good to go for 120, whatever, as long as I'm able-bodied, <laughs> you know? Yes, of course. And, um, but I have zero fear of, zero fear of death. I know that it's whatever comes after we walk through that door. And when we're introduced to Alex, I don't know that it's multiple dimensions. I don't know if we get cycled back. I've yeah. known. I like that answer a lot mm-hmm. because I think that's true. It's like, you didn't, you died and came back, but you didn't die and stay dead. Right. Even right. though I say dead tongue in cheek, because clearly what you've shown and what so many of my guests have shown is that death is an illusion that it's just the death of the body it's an, you walk through a door. Yeah. yeah you walk through a door and so I appreciate that and thank you so much for sharing your story which I know you've shared so many times it, me- it means the world that you're willing to repeat it for those who may not have heard it or for people who have heard it but they may have heard different details well, so there's this thing it's an exchange of energy and you yeah. should know this is entirely different than how I've presented in the past. You have pulled so much more that's available to talk about than I typically, you know, am able to provide in an interview because of the space that you've provided and because thank of who you. you So thank you. That it's really means a lot to me. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm really, I thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your love, your energy, 
and for doing the work that you're doing because I know you're doing it from your heart because you want to share the message and let people know this isn't all there is. And that's why I do this work too, is it's, 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 well, it's inspiring for me. Um, and it, it, it makes, I think going through life's trials a lot easier. And so it's really wonderful what you're doing and thank you so much for your time. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. My pleasure, Angie.